Yes, understood. Thank you so much. Well, as we're waiting for uh, His Holiness to arrive, um, I wanted to, to point out, you, you've already had a chance this morning to meet Mathieu Ricard, and you know that uh, Mathieu uh, brings a, a very unique, I think, perspective to this entire endeavor. As a Westerner who was trained in biological science and then took up robes, uh, practiced as a monastic for, for many years, and now is really serving as something of the interface between the worlds of science and, and contemplative practice. Um, one of the things that maybe some of you don't know is that Mathieu himself has also been a participant in, or in the older language we used to use, a subject within uh, the research that some of which you're going to hear about today. So I thought I might ask Mathieu uh, if he could um, comment, first of all, we'll have a chance to hear him uh, have some other reflections later, but first of all, some things about uh, the nature of what, what it's like to work as both a collaborator in research and as being a participant in the studies. So again, while uh, happily waiting for His Holiness is the spare wheel again. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it was, uh, you know, in the 2000 meeting, uh, you know, Francisco first had warmed me up a little bit, and then in the 2000 meeting on destructive emotion, when this idea of launching a more ambitious program of research. And then I, I don't know, there was a sort of moment that you think, where well, did I do right? I, I raised my hand and then I found out myself having a wonderful time with uh, Francisco in France and Antoine Lutz in, uh, before he moved to Richie's lab and then in Richie's lab and, and quite a few other labs, sort of flying guinea pig style. <laughs> but I think what uh, really appeared, and I think, um, of course, Richie would agree with that, is that, you know, he said, okay, we'll study what is mind training. First of all, you know, what does that mean? Meditation doesn't mean anything as more than cultivating something or becoming familiar with a state of mind, a quality, or a way of experiencing the world. So there's no such thing as studying meditation per itself, no more than there is, you know, you could have common denominators to all kinds of training, but... What are you training? Is it attention? Is it emotional balance? Is it compassion? So that will have definitely different signatures in the brain and different uh, lived, emo lived experience. And also, how you do that? You know, do you shuffle someone into the scanner and say, please meditate for one hour and we'll see what happens? And raise your hand when you feel something, <laughs> which of course you can do in the scanner. And so basically what we measure is differences between resting states and engaging in meditation and also people who have not gone through such training doing the same or trying to do the same. And then also there was a question of the duration that is linked with the technicalities of the equipment. You cannot just wait for 10 minutes for someone to really warm up and get. So we didn't know either. You know, we have not ever done a 15 seconds meditation. I mean, well, usually that's not what we do in the Hermitage. We have plenty of time. <laughs> you know, we go for six months, so you don't worry about those 15 seconds. <laughs> but it's critical for the collaboration that we do. So then the, we came. You know, the first time we experimented that, we were trying to fix what is the appropriate time for the resting state, whatever that means, the neutral state, which may be neutral in different ways for different people, and also, how long does it take to get in a stage of the best you can do as a person at that particular moment while not sitting in front of the Himalayas but lying down in that apparatus that has four characteristics, that is, it is narrow, it is dark, and it is uh, uh, noisy, and which is the fourth one? There's a four it is narrow, it is dark, it is where well, there's another one. Anyway, you are lying down, which is of course not ideal for you no. Know, yeah, for, for, for being, you know, the best of your alertness. Like in meditating in New York. <laughs> well, uh, yes, or so, well, meditating in the subway or something like that. <laughs> but even then, it's, you know, at least we are sitting properly. <laughs> so anyway, and it turned out that despite all these conditions, uh, uh, it seems that, you know, 
whatever you can be uh, instead of compassion, we could reasonably get to something that we felt was reasonably of quality, clarity, and stability within something like 10, 15 seconds. So that, that, that particularity it could have been different, uh, made much easier the collaboration. And then also, part of that collaboration is basically from understanding what the scientist wants to probe, and your feeling about what type of meditation could work. And you could start making suggestions. And then uh, I remember even in the beginning, even from within the scanner, I said, well, why don't we try to do this and that? And so oh, let, let, let's say we have to change the protocol and all that. But so the, 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 the contemplative can make some kind of prediction. When we did the study with Bob Levinson and Paul Ekman about the startle, you know, how any kind of meditation will be able to reduce or even possibly uh, avoid the, the big jump when there's a sudden detonation. From the beginning, I thought, well, there's one kind of meditation that we call open presence, which is to make your, instead of focusing on the impeding sound, to make your mind so vast that, you know, the detonation is going to be one event in the present moment like any other one in a big space, mental space, not a congested one. And it turns out that this was the state of mind that when there's a startle almost suppress any facial expression. Sometimes we, we can be wrong, and it's also interesting. The other aspect is when we begin discussing about the result of the findings. For instance, when we did the compassion study, I think, Richie, you might be, uh, we were wondering why I think the premotor area was engaged. And immediately to, for me, it came out, well, compassion, of course, is a mental state, but it implies a readiness for action because there is no more barrier, you know, self-absorption, self-centeredness, rumination, it's me, me, me all the time. You feel vulnerable because of that. And of course, you want to protect yourself. You are fearful of what may happen. So you are mostly self-concerned. Self but if you do have compassion, the way, not you know, the distressing compassion, but the courageous compassion, and then you are mostly really others are focused, uh, sort of warm feeling of loving kindness and wanting to remedy the suffering, and then you are not feel specially vulnerable. You are also ready to act. There's no anymore any barrier. As Jonas says, it transcends the in-group, out-group. So this, it is understandable, and when we discuss that, we can offer an interpretation. With the startle, for instance, our interpretation was that the startle normally brings you back to the present moment when you are distracted. So if you are really there, then there's nothing to bring you back. You're already there. So as a control, we purposely tried to distract ourselves. I was imagi imagining myself uh, driving on the bad roads of Tibet, visiting our humanitarian projects and visualizing them very clearly. And when the explosion came, I almost fall off, fell off my chair <laughs> because I was suddenly brought back to here and now. So all this, I think, this is the kind of thing that we uh, slowly can bring up a, a very uh, you know, constructive uh, collaboration and, and where the first pers person perspective uh, is not just you know, a, a secondary matters, but it's crucial yes. to the also imagining further research, you know, and understanding what's going on, establishing right protocols. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you articulated that. You know, uh, when we speak of uh, mind and life endeavoring to pursue uh, a new way of knowing and a new uh, way of investigating, bringing together this uh, first and third person perspective, uh, sometimes that sounds a little abstract, I think. But this is very much what we're talking about. Um, not only uh, what had been done before, mind and life, which was basically uh, bringing meditators into the lab and seeing what their brain electrical activity looked like or some other measure, uh, but really bringing contemplatives into the lab as full collaborators. Uh, because that's also that second person perspective that is able to interact with investigators to uh, look at observations that are made and help with the interpretation of them that without that first person experience as a, a long-term contemplative, I don't think is really possible. Another example is uh, when I was with our friend Tanya Singer, and we were interested to first we see if we could modulate 
the level of your compassion. 30%, 60%, 90%. So what does that mean, you know? Or the, I don't like this guy very much. I can give him only 30% of my compassion. <laughs> it's not really that. It's not when you have a, a mental state, it's coming first. You know, it's, it's, it, takes, it takes birth and then it amplifies and then it fills your mind. So you could regulate that and it turned out it, exactly what happened. You know, it's roughly 30, 60 and 100%. And then Tanya, so that's why I've been training for that. And we have a perception of the intensity, so that's okay. Then Tanya thought, could you do that with something else that you don't train for, like disgust? So I won't tell you what I was visualizing, but basically <laughs> it was falling at different levels of depth in a kind of a liquid toilet, which I visited somewhere when I was going to Tibet. <laughs> and it worked very, very well, you know, 30%, 60%, 90% as well, and going up and down. And then we did that because we did some previous uh, study with pain, of imagining pain without having real physical pain. You know, imagining a very burning, you know, like a high run on your, f I mean, I was increasing it a little bit over, and then also doing that 30%, 60%, 90%, and it turned out it activated quite a lot of the whole network that has to do with pain. So that also shows that when we have real pain, uh, there's a lot that you can make up with your mind. Is it Sonia's coming, or is someone watch keeping watch? 42 seconds. So I think we should reasonably close here for the time being. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mathieu. Well, you know, one nice thing we could do in these 30 seconds remaining is rather than just talking about contemplative practice, perhaps we could all drop into 20 seconds of it. <laughs> so, um, as we patiently wait, uh, feel yourself in the chair, how we're grounded uh, in this very moment of experience, and how that groundedness gives us a kind of openness to what we're going to be hearing about for the afternoon. Let's see. Yeah. From China. <laughs> okay. Oh, Vietnamese. Vietnamese. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. We come see you on November 17 oh, right in Barcelona. Uh, okay, yes. Right, there's a Hindi. Welcome back. Hope you had a good lunch. I'm Al Kaznak from the University of Arizona. Oh, and Arizona. also Chief Academic Officer for oh. Mind and Life. I know you know Richie and oh. Cliff very well. Oh. This is oh. Bruce McKeown. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Long time, friend. Long time. Okay.
Well, Your Holiness, we're so delighted you're back with us again for the second session. And I think that your remarks in the morning were very predictive of where we're going to be moving oh. this afternoon. Because you asked, what is the mechanism? And that's really what we're going to be talking a great deal about this afternoon. Trying to go deeper into the biology, looking at not only what happens in the brain and body when stress and adversity occurs, whether in childhood or adulthood, but also what happens in brain and body when we do things to try to ameliorate that suffering and distress. So we're going to begin with Professor Davidson, who you know very well from University of Wisconsin, who's going to be talking about adverse experience in early childhood and some of the things that can be done, perhaps, to make that situation better. <coughs> Wonderful to be with you again, Your Holiness. Uh, the, the monitors. Al? The front monitors. Oh, uh, up in the control booth, uh, the monitors are not on in front. So, Your Holiness, before we begin, I'd like to just take this opportunity to uh, just say that uh, there are a number of young scientists in the audience today. We're at Rockefeller University, one of the premier um, research institutions in the world. And uh, uh, I, the young scientists have benefited so much from your involvement in Mind and Life, your inspiration and passion uh, for the scientific research in which we've been engaged. And on behalf of uh, all the next generation of scientists, I want to just express our gratitude for your continuing involvement in these dialogues. I think they've been so important and so inspiring. <laughs> Today, Your Holiness, I'd like to uh, talk about some work that uh, I've actually never had the opportunity to talk with you about before. Uh, and it's work uh, looking at the effects of early adversity, <coughs> early stress of different kinds, and how it gets under our skin and actually changes our brain, changes our brain function, as well as literally the very structure of the brain. And then what can we do about it? Can we use interventions that secular interventions that have been inspired by your interest in secular ethics. And can we bring that to very young children to help address uh, some of these uh, uh, adverse consequences of these early stressful experiences? And um, what, what do we know about that and how can we measure that? So that's what I'll be referring to today. So let me just start with two premises and initial conjectures. The first is that early life stress impacts the brain and it specifically impacts the circuitry important for emotion and emotion regulation. And the second is that behavioral interventions, including those that come from contemplative traditions, can induce changes in these circuits that underlie these dimensions of emotion regulation and thereby produce meaningful behavioral change. So my talk will really be three points, and this is uh, the, the core of everything I'm talking about. The first is that early experience modifies brain structure and function. The second is that, as Liz talked about so beautifully this morning, self-regulation in childhood predicts successful life outcomes of many different kinds. Liz talked about a very important study that I'll come back to that shows that early self-regulation <laughs> predicts uh, when an individual is in his or her 30s, it predicts their financial success, it predicts the likelihood of them using um, substances, illegal drugs. It predicts um, 
uh, medical outcomes, uh, and it actually predicts criminal convictions. That is, people, ch individuals who as children are better able to regulate themselves and their emotions end up uh, the least likely to uh, have any problems with the law. So this study <coughs> correlated I mean self-regulation self -regulation with the in, ch in childhood in general or those childhood? Or is it a s specific subgroup? No, it, it's in general. In general. general. Okay. In general. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, across the spectrum. Mm. Uh, and the third point is that healthy health... So one would expect that ch children who have been exposed to stress environment early early on will would you say that one would expect them to have difficulty greater difficulty with self-regulation yes oh, okay. yes okay. yes and it affects their brain and I'll show Desert. some oh. yeah, yes and the third point is that healthy habits of mind can be cultivated very early in life and that this training can have very beneficial long-term effects mm -hmm. so um, it's not important that the details of this are uh, hard to see here, but what this is a study that we did um, that was published a couple of years ago with children who are physically abused in childhood. And unfortunately, there is um, a, a population of these children here in America today. Uh, and um, what we observed is that in these children, uh, the a part of their prefrontal cortex, which is critical for self-regulation, actually diminishes in size. It's actually smaller. And the extent to which it shrinks is actually associated with how much stress the child has in his or her life, particularly their family stress mm -hmm. in, within their family and academic stress stress that they experience in the academic setting. The more stress, the smaller this area of the brain, which is so important for self-regulation. And there are other studies of this kind. Other work shows that children who are raised, who have been raised in Romanian orphanages um, in Eastern Europe uh, have very similar uh, changes to their brain even when they're adopted into middle-class families in the US. So these are long-term effects uh, of this kind of early adversity. So Liz... So, <coughs> so these children were adopted later, so can that kind of deficiency can be restored? Well, that's a, a critical question and the, the evidence that I'll show today um, suggests that we think some of the changes mm -hmm. can be reversed um, with early training. So Liz showed yesterday, this, um, or, uh, this, this morning, um, she talked about this study of self-regulation. And one of the key aspects of self-regulation is the connection between the prefrontal cortex, which we've mentioned, and that's an area that shrinks in size with early adversity, and the amygdala, which um, Bruce will talk about later, and is so important for um, fear and stress and uh, detection of threats in our environment. It's important for many different emotional functions, not just those, but certainly those. And it, we, there's increasing evidence that suggests that the connection between these parts of the brain is especially important. And um, we recently completed a study, uh, and again, I'll explain the details here. This was a study where we followed a group of children from birth, and we tested them at many different points from birth, and the last testing point is when they're 18 years of age. And we looked at the impact of early adversity within the first year of life. And I'll say more about what that early adversity is, but it includes, for example, having a mother who is depressed and who is, um, uh, has difficult, uh, a difficult time with parenting. And what we see is that... 
a longitudinal study from birth to age 18 years. Um, so when the children were four and a half years of age, we measured a hormone that um, Bruce is actually one of the world's experts in, a hormone called cortisol, which is a hormone that is very critical to our basic functions. It plays a very important role in stress, but it also plays, a, it's important for us to have, we, we couldn't live without it. Uh, and so it's not just uh, a hormone that's bad, but if, it's very, if it, it is at a very high level for a long period of time, then it can have deleterious or negative consequences. And so um, what we are looking at here is the connection between two parts of the brain. One is this part which is in the prefrontal cortex and uh, a part down here, which is the amygdala. And we can measure that using modern functional imaging methods, which Your Holiness has seen in the laboratory. We can measure the strength of that connection. And it turns out that individuals who have a stronger connection between those regions, meaning or implying that the prefrontal cortex is able to modulate or um, dampen activity in the amygdala, so the higher... Right. So the, the stronger the connection, the lower the cortisol um, when the children were four and a half years of age, um, which was cortisol taken on many different days over a period of time, um, implying that uh, uh, there was a regulation of the stress hormone that was very adaptive. Uh, the children who had less connection between these areas of the brain had a much higher level of cortisol. Now we can ask, I circled a data point uh, on the extreme end of the continuum. This is a child who had very high levels of cortisol and very low connection between these areas of the brain. Now, the mothers of, that, of children who were in that end were clinically depressed during the first year of life. They actually um, had clinical depression. Uh, the parents were fighting and arguing. <laughs> So this low connectivity, the weak connectivity between these two regions of the brain, w I mean, is it something kind of more genetically inherited or is it something to do with the environment? We, we think it's mostly produced by this early environment. The, the environment... Uh, 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 yes. So, and this is what their environments were like. The parents were fighting and arguing in the home. They had very, a very critical partner who <laughs> criticized them all the time. The mothers reported they were often angry with their child, and they actually reported that their child was a disappointment to them. <laughs> and <laughs> the mothers <laughs> doubted their ability as a parent, and they reported feeling trapped. And they also reported that they didn't have enough money to make ends meet. Now, on the other end of the graph, we have individuals who have strong connection between these areas and low levels of this hormone cortisol. And they had mothers who were not depressed, were actually quite happy. Um, they rarely fought with their spouse. Um, they were rare, rarely angry with their child, and they strongly disagreed with the statement, my child is a bit of a disappointment. They strongly disagreed with that. And the mom also enjoyed being a parent, 
and she felt that she had some things to d- things that she could do or some time to do things that she enjoyed. And there was only occasional worry about money. Um, so very different profile. Uh, and this is the, 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 the life in the first year of the child's experience. So this is all data taken in their first year of life. So Liz showed this study this morning, uh, and I want to just read one sentence at the end of this study, the conclusion to this study. The scientists said, interventions addressing self-control or self-regulation might reduce a panoply of societal costs, save taxpayers money, and promote prosperity. So what might those interventions be? So, Your Holiness, I'd like to now tell you about the kindness curriculum. This is a curriculum that we in our center developed for preschool children, ages four and five years of age, and we're now, Your Holiness, doing this in the Madison Public Schools with 200 children uh, uh, in the public school system. And this is just uh, a list, it's eight weeks, and we go into the classroom for 90 minutes a week, three 30-minute periods. And before we actually do the intervention with the kids, um, the teachers go through 10 weeks of um, some simple mindfulness training that's based on our friend John Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness-based stress reduction, which Your Holiness has heard a lot about. Um, so the teachers go through this and then each week they go through different sections like being, becoming mindful of their bodies, um, being aware of their emotions on the inside, how to better work with problems that arise, and then um, cultivating kindness, uh, and then working out problems once they've calmed down, uh, expressing gratitude and practicing the development of positive emotions, understanding that we're all interconnected uh, with each other and the planet, and finally ending on gratitude for our world. Um, Now, as children go through this, these are teacher reports of pro-social behavior, such as cooperation and sharing. Um, The blue line at the top are the children who are randomly assigned to the kindness curriculum. The purple line are the controls. And you can see over the course of eight weeks, there's a gradual increase in the teacher reports of pro-social behavior. These are parent reports of emotion regulation from before the intervention to after. And so before, there's no difference between the groups. And after the intervention, the parents are reporting uh, a little bit better emotion regulation just after eight weeks. And then we developed a task to measure the impact um, uh, on sharing. And what we did is to find out in each class who the child's best friend was and who the child's least favorite friend was. And we took a picture of their best friend and we took a picture of their least favorite friend and we put the pictures on an envelope. Uh, And we have an envelope with their best friend, an envelope with a picture of their least favorite friend, and then we have an envelope with a picture of a stranger child who the Um, child has never seen before, but it's the same gender child. And then finally, we have a picture of a sick-looking child with a bandage. And then we give the kids stickers, which kids really like at this age and is really an important currency. And we say, please, (laughs) please distribute the stickers into the different envelopes. So we say, please distribute the stickers into the envelopes according to your preference, where you would like this to go. Before the intervention, they give most of the stickers to their best friend. The big blue line is their best friend. And they give most of the stickers to their best friend, and they distribute the remaining to the other three groups. But most of them go to their best friend. After eight weeks of intervention, the distributions are totally (laughs) flat. Um, They give an equal number of stickers to uh, the different categories of children. And while this is just stickers, I think that this is a case where um, it's a proof of concept that we can actually, in very young children, 
um, with a simple intervention, we can actually make a difference. So uh, these are all the people who've contributed, and I want to just thank you, Your Holiness, um, for uh, the years of inspiration for um, the work that we and many others are doing. Thank you.